Good evening, everybody. Welcome to, <laughs> I almost said Young at Hearts. <laughs> what is this? 2020, right? So, great. Welcome to 2020. We've got several questions for you tonight, depending on time, of course. And I've had these for, for a little while. So we'll just kind of go through them. And some of them are related to uh, one another. So um, let's start off with the first one. And here's the question. Leviticus 23, verse 3, tells us not to work on Sunday, while Exodus 20, verse 8, tells us the same, but also to keep Sundays holy. But actually, uh, this is what the question says, but I'm going to explain it a little bit more in a second. In the Ten Commandments, in the New Testament, in Luke 13 and 14, when Christ healed on the Sabbath, the Pharisees quoted Old Testament law when criticizing him. He asked if they wouldn't get an ox or ass out of a pit if it fell in on the Sabbath. However, not once did it say it was no longer a law to be adhered to. Growing up, we weren't even allowed to sew on a button lest it be considered work. Thus my question, are we to refrain from work on Sunday and only do what is holy? So I want to go back and read the first part of the, the question again. Leviticus 23.3 tells us not to work on Sunday, while Exodus 28, 20, verse 8 tells us the same, but also to keep Sundays holy. Uh, I want to explain something first before I get into um, what, this is, what, what the gist of the question is. Uh, these two verses, Leviticus and Exodus, don't talk about Sunday. They talk about the Sabbath, and there's a huge difference between the two. We are to keep the Sabbath holy. That is, the Jews were commanded to keep the Sabbath holy. God gave that command to them, and it was actually assigned to Israel to keep the Sabbath holy. Now, the Sabbath is the seventh day of the week. Uh, Shabbat is the Hebrew word, and it's talking about the seventh day. I'm going to ask somebody to turn to Exodus chapter 16 and read verse 26. Someone else go to chapter 20 and read verses 10 and 11. And let me know when you get there. Exodus chapter 16. Anybody there? 16 verse 26. Yeah, with the phones and iPads, we can, we can get to those verses a lot quicker than we used to be able to, right? on the seventh day, which is the Sabbath, in it there shall be done. There shall be none. Okay. Let me say it again, please. Six days you shall gather it, but on the seventh day, which is the Sabbath, in it there shall be none. Great. Thank you. So he's talking about the rules for obeying the Sabbath there, but, he, but the, what I want to put, note in that passage explicitly, it says that the seventh day is the Sabbath day. Then we go to Exodus chapter 20, which is where the Lord gives the Ten Commandments to Moses on Mount Sinai. Who's got verses 10 and 11? But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God, in it thou shalt not do any work, thou nor thy son, nor thy daughter. Lost it on me. Nor thy man, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within the gates. For in the six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that all that in them is. And rest the seventh day, wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Okay, thank you. So again, it's telling us there, verse 26 of chapter 16, verses 10 and 11 of chapter 20, and there are numerous other places as well throughout the Pentateuch. The Pentateuch is the first five books of Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Numerous times it, it couples the word Sabbath with the seventh day. So there's no question that the Sabbath is the seventh day of the week. And if you look at your calendar the way calendars are supposed to be. You'll see Sunday on the left-hand side, that's the first day of the week. Saturday's on the right-hand side, that's the seventh day of the week. That's the way God set things up. Saturday is the Sabbath day, and that's why Jews go to temple on, the, on Saturdays. Um, and that is their holy day, okay? Now, there are other days that are called Sabbaths. Uh, those are special days, high holy days, like the Passover, for example, is a floating holiday. It, it's, uh, it, it happens on a certain day of the month, not a certain day of the week. So if, if the Sabbath happens, I mean, sorry, if the, if the Passover happens to fall on Wednesday, then Wednesday is also a Sabbath day. You understand what I'm saying? And then Saturday that week will be another Sabbath day. So it'll be two Sabbaths in one week. But the, the seventh day is the Sabbath day. Now, 
all the Ten Commandments are repeated in the New Testament in various forms. The command to, to honor the Lord, you know, honor your parents, don't steal, don't, don't bear false witness, don't commit adultery, don't covet things. All those are repeated in the New Testament, all of them except one, and that's the fourth commandment, to keep the Sabbath day, honor the Sabbath day, and keep it holy. That is not repeated in the New Testament. That's fascinating, isn't it? Why are we sitting here on Sunday instead of yesterday? Well, it's not that we're all procrastinators or really, really late. It's that in the New Testament, the disciples worshiped on the first day of the week, not the seventh day of the week. Why is that? Well, we see that pattern laid out in each of the four Gospels, the, the last chapter of each. Matthew 28, verse 1, uh, Mark 16, verse 2, Luke 24, verse 1, and John chapter 20, verse 1. What we see is that Jesus rose on the first day of the week, right? We also see that he appeared to his disciples, chapter 20, John chapter 20, verse 19, we see that the Lord appeared to his disciples as they met together in the upper room on the evening of the first day of the week. You know, he did that again the following Sunday, Sunday evening. He appeared to them again. We also see that the Apostle Paul, in his instructions to the church at Corinth, regarding their practices as a church, and there were numerous things he discussed in 1 Corinthians, a lot of different issues that church had. The first letter was very corrective. The second one was a little bit more uh, encouraging, but the first one was very corrective. And in chapter 16 of 1 Corinthians, verse 2, he admonishes them to uh, gather offerings on the first day of the week. He says, upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store as God hath prospered him that there be no gatherings when I come. So he's telling them to, to take their offerings on the first day of the week, presumably because that's when the disciples met and worshiped and broke bread together. So that is why we meet on Sundays, and that's why Sunday is called the Christian Sabbath. That's not a biblical term. But that is the term that we use because we honor the Lord and worship together and gather together and fellowship together and break bread together on the first day of the week, not the seventh day of the week. Okay. Now, that having been established, and I don't think there's going to be any great dispute about that here, the gist of the question is, should, what should we do about Sundays? Should we keep it as holy as Christians as the Jews did or, and do with the Sabbath day? Now, one of the things we need to keep in mind is that the various groups of the Jewish leaders and priests and scribes and, and so forth uh, had different views about how to honor the Sabbath day. Now, the Lord had his views. He said, we're not to work on the Sabbath day, right? They were not to work on the Sabbath day. They were not to gather food, for example. You know, when manna came down out of heaven, uh, they were to gather it six days, not the seventh day. Now, you remember when that first was established, some of the people went out and tried to gather um, manna on the seventh day, and they said, there isn't any here. Um, and Moses was angry with them, okay? But God said, you gather twice as much on the sixth day, Friday, and I'll make sure it lasts until the first day. And so that's what they did for the rest of their time in the wilderness. God says, no work on the Sabbath day. Now, the Pharisees and scribes and so forth they debated endlessly over what is considered work. And that's where this dispute came from, over rescuing an ox or an ass in a pit on the Sabbath day. They considered that an act of mercy. Jesus said, hey, listen, you know, I'm healing this guy's withered hand on the Sabbath day. You consider that work? You'd take care of your animals if they fell into a pit on the Sabbath day. You don't consider that work. You consider that merciful. That's what I consider this with this man. This is not work. He's thinking, this is a pleasure. You know, this, is, this is ministry. This is what I came, came for. So, so the question is, what is considered work? Well, we don't want to get into an endless debate and split hairs among us over what is considered work, but I would say this as a general principle, that we need to treat Sunday like the Jews treat Saturday. The whole day is the Lord's day, just as the whole day is the Sabbath day. Now, the Sabbath day, uh, remember, begins on Friday evening and ends on Saturday evening. And then you can get into a debate with the Jews over, okay, when does evening begin? 
Well, what they finally decided was, when you go outside and you can see three stars in the evening sky, that's when, that's when it begins. And when you go outside on Saturday evening and see three stars in the evening, that's when Sabbath is over. Okay? There, so the, the Jewish day ran from evening to evening because that's, actually, that's biblical. <laughs> Genesis chapter 1, and the evening and the morning were the first day, the evening and the morning were the second day, so forth. And so, actually, they've got it right. You know, for us as Gentiles to go from midnight to midnight is totally arbitrary. <laughs> uh, there is at, le- is at least as biblical, right? But we define Sunday as the Sabbath day from midnight to midnight. If that's the way we're going to determine it, it doesn't really matter, I don't think, to God. I don't think it gets all bent out of shape if we don't start ours on Saturday evening. But, but the point is, what are you going to do with Sunday? What are you going to do with the Lord's day? I will say that I don't think the Lord's Day is a day for work. I see that in Scripture, and I've also experienced that personally. I've told you this story many times before, and I hate to use myself for an example all the time, but I do, the Apostle Paul used himself as an, as an example numerous times as well, so I'm going to do that again. Uh, I remember when I first became a Christian and started coming to church. Remember I got saved in my bedroom. Someone gave me a tract on the street corner. I didn't get saved in church service didn't grow up in a gospel preaching church, so all that was new to me. When I, when I started coming to church, I started coming on Monday night to a Bible study held outside the church. Then I started coming on Wednesday nights. Then I started coming on Sunday nights. And I was really reluctant to come Sunday mornings because I had a job. I had several jobs at the time. I worked five days during the week in one job, and I worked uh, weekends on another job. Uh, and my Saturday and Sunday job was the most fun job of the ones I had. Uh, I worked switchboard. Uh, and as a receptionist at Wesley Glen Retirement Center up here on High Street next to, next to Graceland Shopping Center. Um, and I really liked it because I, I interacted with the folks there. I liked them. I had fun with them. They, they liked me and for some reason. And so uh, I, I just enjoyed working there on Saturday during the day and Sunday during the day. But the Lord was really convicting me about going to church on Sundays. And I know, I mean, it was very clear to me uh, that the Lord wanted me to quit that job and start going to church on Sundays. And I just really, <laughs> I didn't want to do it. Um, and so I went on that, for that, that way for a while. It wasn't really long. It was a couple of months, I think. And uh, I was just fighting it, feeling this burden, this conviction. I knew I was doing the wrong thing, but I just, I continued doing it. And then one Monday, I got a call from my supervisor there in the office and said, she just simply said, your services are no longer required. Uh, and I had two jobs in that place. One was uh, in the dining room and the other one was in, in the office. The weekend job in the office, they just fired me from that job. Uh, no reason given. And then, but they didn't fire me from the other job. I was, I was fine down there. <clears throat> um, and other people who worked there, who were, who were my friends, they looked into it. They knew the people who, who were my supervisor and her supervisor above her and inquired, made inquiries behind the scenes, and no one had a reason for why I was let go. But I knew. I knew very well. I mean, I, there was no doubt in my mind uh, why that happened. <laughs> I said, Lord, I, I get the message, you know. And so I started going to church on Sunday, and I've been doing that ever since, and when I have had jobs, when I was supposed to work on Sunday, I would not do it. Now, <laughs> this, is the, this is the controversial part, probably. Um, years later, I had a job in a Kimberly Clark factory. Kimberly Clark makes paper products, you know, Kleenexes, and, and uh, um, we were making, um, what are those diapers? Uh, um, the diapers that uh, have stretches on them. Pampers, yeah. Is that... I think that was it. Um, they were brand new. They weren't on the market yet. It was top secret. We were, we were making those things. And I was running, working on the assembly line. And we, we had uh, shift work. You know, when you, you work uh, days this week, seven days on, and then you have two days off, and then you start on uh, third shift. You're there for seven days and two days off. Then you work second shift. Then you're off for three days, and you start back over again. Well, two, two weekends a month, I was required to work on Sunday, Sunday during the day. That's the way that worked out. But I wouldn't do it. And I went to my supervisor and explained to him. I, I mean, it was all above board. I told him, I said, Rick, I said, uh, uh, here's the situation. You know, I, I've, I've got to be in church. You know, I have to be. I mean, I, I'm, I'm a preacher. 
uh, and I, I need to go, and, uh, and I, I would just want you to know that every time my shift comes up on Sunday, I'm going to call in. He said, I understand. That's fine. Just know it, it will go on your attendance record. They won't fire you for it, but uh, it'll be hard for you to get, get a job back if you leave and go somewhere else. I said, I understand. That. I'm good with that. So that's the way it worked. Uh, every Sunday morning, I would call in and say, I'm not going to be able to come in today. Um, and that's the way it was. So um, because I knew <laughs> what happened before, if I was going to start going to work at Kimberly Clark, I was going to get fired, right? Not by Kimberly Clark. God was going to make sure I got fired, okay? Because God had established in my life that Sundays are for him, not for other reasons. Even though I got double time on Sundays. Even though it was part of my regular shift, when you work Sundays, you got double time. It was kind of hard to turn that money down. But some things are more important. And being obedient to the Lord was more important. Because I learned that lesson from Wesley Glenn over there. Uh, so, yes, I believe Sundays are the Lord's day all day, all day. Not part of the day for him and then part to do what I want to do. The whole day is for him. Now, as far as what's considered work on Sunday, I'll leave that up to you and the Holy Spirit. I know that he's perfectly capable of making it clear what is work and what he accepts and what he doesn't. So I'm, I'm not uh, the Holy Spirit, and you can be happy about that. So let's go on to the next question with the time remaining to us. Oh, not a whole lot, but we'll, we'll get in, into it. Leviticus 18 forbids specific sexual practices, while in the New Testament, in Hebrews 13.4, it says that the marriage bed is undefiled, although fabricators or fo uh, fornicators and adulterers will be judged. This would appear to supersede Old Testament law for married couples and say anything is okay. Am I understanding this correctly? Well, let me say it this way. Some of those... Although some of those sexual practices were outlawed in Leviticus chapter 18 and other places as well in Leviticus, <coughs> excuse me, uh, they are still outlawed. That was not changed in the New Testament. Those practices outlawed then are still wrong today. And in New, in New Testament, although the marriage bed is undefiled, and anything goes within a marriage, the Lord does restrict what a legal marriage is. Now, in the, in the book that I wrote about marriage, divorce, and remarriage, I explain all this. I explain, first of all, I had to, in order to talk about marriage, I had to define what a marriage is and talk about what a marriage is not. There are marriages that God recognizes, and there are marriages that God does not recognize. And what God recognizes as marriages is not necessarily coinciding with what the government recognizes as marriages, Okay. Now, the Bible defines a marriage as one man, one woman for life, right? That's, that's the practice. Now, what that excludes is, and in other places it specifically excludes, Jews marrying non-Jews, right? And there were places like in the book of Ezra, Nehemiah, where some of the people had married Gentile wives. The term is strange women, and it doesn't mean they looked weird. It means they were Gentiles, okay? They had married Gentiles. And they were told to put away their wives, okay? They were still to take care of them financially, uh, but they were not to live with them as, as husband and wife. And that was God's decree. He did not recognize those marriages, okay? So that is not a legitimate marriage. In the New Testament, we have a similar edict. Believers are not to marry unbelievers. That is a, a marriage that, that is not... Something that God appreciates. Now, if you are, find yourself that you're married to an unbeliever, you're not to leave them. That's 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Now, this is, this was, I, I don't have time to go into the details of it, but uh, back in the first century, you know, Jews were the first Christians, right? All those churches were Jewish believers. They were all Messianic congregations. And the, as believers got saved, sometimes their spouses would not go along with their husband or wife who became a believer, and they would leave them. And so people were finding, trying to find out from the apostle, what do I do about this? Should I get a divorce? I... And I'm going to have to stop there and leave us hanging. Evidently, you're going to do that too. Comments, questions, discussion, silence? Should we go to Dairy Queen? I 
had a similar situation happen with me um, a few years ago because I was in, in between jobs and I had the opportunity to work at Worthington Industries, kind of similar to what you had with uh, Kimberly Clark, where it was five days on, five days off, or something of that nature, where I had to sacrifice weekends. And I did not take that job. And my wife and I talked about it, and we knew that it was gonna put a hamper on any ministry that we had here in the church, and we loved doing ministry here. And so it didn't take that job, waited and waited until the, the perfect one came, which is where I'm at now, and the Lord has really blessed that. Um, as far as the job is concerned, the finances that we have, and so it, it just goes to show, you know, he gives you a mindset that to honor that day, not to work on that day. And, you know, and, and I'm trying to, I'm starting to find that now because uh, in the job that I have now where I'm salaried, sometimes I find myself working on Sundays when I go home in the evening. And just as you were telling me that, I was being convicted, you know, you need to stop working on Sunday. So, um, keep my work during the week. So yeah. just wanted to put that out there. I appreciate that. Yeah, I, I, the Lord has always honored that commitment in my life since I made that commitment, since he forced me to make that commitment. He has really, really honored that and blessed that in more ways than I have time to tell you. Um, Romans 13, 5 speaks of uh, uh, some esteem one day above another and others esteem every day alike. Let each be persuaded in his own mind. Doesn't it sort of say it's sort of, you know, uh, a personal conviction on that? Well, uh, it, it, putting it in context, I would say no. Not in regards to the Lord's Day, it doesn't. Uh, or the Sabbath day, it doesn't. Uh, he's talking about other days, other uh, holy days, uh, special days. Um, I, I, would, I would apply that in a whole different way than I would to the Lord's Day or the Sabbath day. Yeah, those, uh, the Sabbath day is, of course, established by God. And he says it's a perpetual statute. Uh, they will honor, the Jews are to honor that perpetually. I'm talking about all the way into eternity. They're going to honor that. And then uh, the same principle applies to the Christian Sabbath, the first day of the week. So I, I think that's, that's God is something God has established uh, for us. So um, as far as us esteeming things or, or being persuaded in our own mind about these things, I think that's, a, that's applying to other things, other days, but, uh, but not that one. In the context of that chapter, he's talking about Christian liberty in that chapter, and I think that's what he's, that's what he's referring to. Okay, my comment or question is, uh, for some professions, it's difficult not to work on Sunday or Saturday. Mm -hmm. like, I did not want to work on Sunday, mm -hmm. but it's compulsory as a registered nurse to work every other Sunday at least. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they may exempt you, but not all the time. So I just believe that God sees the heart. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, but, but that's a different situation, see? Uh, because I was making products that I'd rather not discuss in mixed company uh, in the Kimberly Clark factory. And that's, that's different. Those things are needed, but they're not absolutely necessary. They, they are not a matter of life and death, and it doesn't fall under what I would talk about with mercy. Remember the situation where the Lord discussed this with the scribes and the Pharisees when he was healing the man with the withered hand on the, on the Sabbath day. That's what the issue was. And they were upset at him considering that work. And he said, this is not mercy. This is mercy. You guys will get your ox, your ass out of a pit on, a, on the Sabbath day. I'm doing something merciful here, the same thing. What you guys do at the hospital is exactly the same thing he's talking about. So that is not something, I mean, are all Christian employees at the you know, surgeons and, and hospital workers supposed to just say, call in sick and go to church on Sunday? No, I don't think that applies. That's, that's different. I know it's employment, but that's... Uh, that falls into a different, completely different category. But it's an excellent point, excellent question. 
And that's why I said, you know, as to what is considered work, I leave that between you and the Holy Spirit because I'm not the Holy Spirit and it's a good thing. Uh, because there are people who would consider that work, I don't. I th think that's, that falls under a different category. Okay, I have the same problem like Irma has. Because uh, I have accident, I didn't drive for eight months. Then my son take me, uh, drop me off here at the church, and we go to the shop and pack me to the shop. And then I told my son, this is my Sabbath day, I don't want to work. If you want to work, you can work, but I'm not work but Sunday. And plus I do laundry on Sunday too. And then uh, now I have Wednesday off. Then I do my laundry on Wednesday. I don't do on Sunday anyway. Mm -hmm. That's why I... That's good. And I think the Lord blesses that. I think he will bless that. Um, three words and I can make my case. Chick-fil-A. Anybody been to Chick-fil-A lately? You see the lines around Chick-fil-A? Can you go there today? How long would the line be there now? You won't find a line there right now, okay? But you might want to go there and get in line if you want a chicken sandwich early tomorrow because it, it's going to be a long line. They can have three lines, four lines around that place. It's busy all the time because I believe God is blessing Chick-fil-A for their decision not to stay open on Sunday. God is giving, uh, giving them uh, extra money during the six days to make up for the seventh day, for the first day. I should say the first day. <laughs> but that's a case uh, of where God honors that decision. Anyone else? I hope this isn't redundant if you already covered it, but uh, I grew up thinking you shouldn't be seen by your neighbors mowing the lawn on Sunday. They should know that you set Sunday aside for worship. And then I've been mowing a lot of lawns for other people in recent years, and uh, a couple times somebody surprised that I was there on Sunday to mow a lawn, and I said, well, I do honor the Lord on Sunday, but such that I didn't want you to have to wait with long grass. And I don't know if they appreciated that or if they were disappointed that I was working on Sunday. I, I suppose it's a gray area. Um, so I'm about to be shamed or condemned or maybe excused. Well, I, it's, again, I'm not, I'm not going to uh, split hairs and, and dictate to people how they should uh, honor the Lord on the Sabbath day. When it comes to lawn care, uh, I will say this, uh, I, I know people who consider it work, and I know con people who consider it leisure. So what do you do with that? I know a lot of guys just decided, I'm gonna switch it from the leisure category to the work category so I don't have to do it on Sunday. But I'm talking about But, but like I said a little while ago, I'm, I'm not the Holy Spirit. I'm going to let him dictate that to you. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to split hairs. Because to some people, it's fun. Other people, it's work. When, when God gave um, Adam the job to till the soil, remember, that was in paradise. Uh, it became work after the fall. And so I, I, you know, I, I'm, not going to, I'm not going to make that determination. Hello. Hi. All right, I have a question. Uh, been married twice, currently going through a divorce. Uh, first wife, and I, um, I made the, um, well, I asked her, are you a Christian? Kind of left it at that. She said yes. I said, tell me your testimony. Uh, she did. Um, turned into a non-practicing Christian. <laughs> Not against Christianity, but kind of went into the tarot card reading, Wicca type stuff. And um, soon after, years later, um, we split. No, go ahead. They're talking upstairs. Oh, okay. Uh, and now I've, uh, Nat was ordained. My father actually married us. He's a pastor, uh, ordained minister. And um, the second marriage, we were married civilly, but the same situation. I've confirmed Christianity through her testimony. Um, it 
wasn't as traditional asking Jesus to come into her heart I, that I'm aware of, but she did have an interaction with God that she believed that she was saved. So I didn't judge that, but yet here I am going through a second divorce. Was my first marriage correct and God recognized? And is my second marriage? It was actually uh, civilly, it was performed civilly with the court system because of the immigration process and we never did do another ceremony religiously. So I'd like to know your thoughts on that, what you think about that, and is everything cool or not cool? <laughs> well, um, I, I tell you, I am very glad that I am not God. That's, uh, that's God's job to make that call, you know. Um, I couldn't tell you. What, what, the, what God tells us, though, is that, like, as far as divorce and remarriage and stuff, that uh, if, if, if someone is, well, it, you're talking about the spiritual condition, and, and I can't answer that. I honestly can't, because I, I don't know uh, for sure. You can't know for sure. Um, you, when it comes right down to it, you don't know if I'm saved. I don't know if you're saved, right? So, um, but if a person outright declares that they're a non-believer and they leave you, then, then you're supposed to let them go, right? Um, a, per, a, a person is not under bondage in such cases, Paul said. There are two legitimate biblical reasons for divorce that are given in Scripture, okay? One is adultery, and the other one is abandonment, okay? So if a person leaves, that's the abandonment right? If, uh, if they commit adultery, that's another reason, although it's not just that cut and dried. When someone sins against us, we're to forgive them, right? How many times? Seventy times seven. So fortunately, your phone and probably my, my phone and your phone, probably the same way, you have a calculator, right? So, okay, that's one, okay? Don't do it again. You do it again? Okay. There's two. Can you see the two? Okay. Now, you got 488 more chances. Okay, now is that what he meant? No, that's not what he meant. We're not going to keep track of him, but what he's saying is, is forgive. Okay, forgive when somebody uh, sins against you and repents okay? and ask forgiveness. Now, but... He did make a way for divorce because of the hardness of our heart. Sometimes we can't do that over and over and over and over again. Every person has their limit. Some can't endure it one time. Some, I, I've known others who've gone through multiple um, instances where their, their spouse has committed multiple adulteries against them, okay, with different people. They had their breaking point at some time. And others I know have, had, have gone through that numerous times and are still together, okay? Every person has a different limit. But God does allow for divorce in that case, okay? And then after that, if there is a legitimate lawful decree of divorce, Deuteronomy chapter 25 explains the process there, uh, then the person can get remarried. But we are restricted to marrying only believers, right? 1 Corinthians chapter 7. <clears throat> now, the other restriction there, the one, a marriage that God does not recognize, is if two people get divorced, one of them remarries and then gets divorced, those two people cannot get together again and remarry. Okay? Once one spouse or the other remarries, then there's no chance for reconciliation. As long as ne neither of them have married anybody else, then they can get together, right? They can re reconcile. That's another case I did not get to in my time limit. But, <clears throat> but as far as the spiritual thing you talked about... I, I can't, I couldn't tell you. I couldn't make that call. But if they abandon you, then that, that's all you need to know. Whether they're saved or, or unsaved, if they abandon you, if they left, then that's a legitimate grounds for a divorce. And what do you think about the um, God recognizing the marriages? Because one was um, married with a minister and the other one was not. I don't think that makes any difference. Um, who officiated at the wedding of Adam and Eve? God. Yeah, I think he was there, yeah. Uh, now, the principle that I talk about in my book on defining marriage, it's, it's, Deuteron it's, uh, sorry, it's Genesis 2.24, where, 
Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife. The principle is leave and cleave. Uh, you leave your family, you cleave to your wife. The two become one flesh. Okay? That's what a marriage is. Uh, it's, it's a lifetime commitment between two people, and one a man and one a woman. Okay? That's what a marriage is. Uh, whether a marriage is done in a church or in a courthouse doesn't matter. In fact, you will not find any marriages done in a church anywhere in the Bible. Okay? Even the wedding at Cain and Galilee doesn't say where it was. It's not important. Um, I, as a pastor, am not mandated to do weddings. It's not something I have to do as part of my job as a pastor. I mean, I do them, but I'll tell you what, I will do far fewer weddings than funerals. I will turn down weddings. I never turn down a funeral. Okay, I think everybody deserves a funeral. But, but, the, but marriages, not everybody has to get married. At least not in church. You know, they can get married in church if they are wanting a Christian marriage and they're willing to do things in a Christian way. You know, but, but two people get married in the courthouse. They get married on a ship by a ship's captain. They get married on an airplane by the pilot. Uh, you, can, you can get married by all kinds of different people. Um, it, it's, it's not important who reads the script. What's important is what the husband and wife say to each other, commit to each other, promise to each other. That is where the marriage takes place. It's between those two people. I have nothing to do with it, really. I'm just, I'm just there for eye candy. Okay? Uh, just a little bit. Um, in the case of moving on from a divorce, what, and this sounds a little stupid, I, I already know the answer to this, but what is the kind of the textbook limit before fornication and adultery? Uh, fornication is between uh, an unmarried person and someone else. Okay? It, it can be a married person and a, safe, and a single person. The single person is committing fornication. The married person is committing adultery. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's what that is. So the adultery is a, a married person going outside the marriage. And fornication is anybody else. So. Any other questions? And we just barely touched on that. Mm -hmm. Very good. That's really good. While nobody's asking a question, let me just throw this in here just, just to kind of tie this up because I don't, I, I don't have enough to continue this next week. But the, the, some of the things, the practices that are listed in Leviticus 18 include things like incest uh, and adultery and bestiality and homosexuality. All those things were forbidden then and they are still forbidden today. When the Bible says in the New Testament that the marriage bed is undefiled, it does not legitimize any of these practices. Incest is still forbidden. Bestiality is still forbidden. Homosexuality is still forbidden. Adultery is still forbidden. And so that's why I, I, wanted, I was defining marriage, what a legitimate marriage is. When you have a legitimate marriage, it eliminates homosexuality, it bestiality. You can't marry your horse, you know. It's one man, one woman. You can't have uh, a marriage with four people, a group marriage. You know, this is common today. This is becoming more common today. People, there are group marriages. Have you heard about this? Three people getting married to each other. Four people, five people getting married to each other as a group marriage. Um, that is not God's plan. God does not recognize that. So that does not mean the marriage bed is undefiled because, well, all five of us are married, so anything we do is okay. No, that's not what that's saying. Those practices in Leviticus 18 are still forbidden, and marriage is still defined as one man, one woman for life. Anything those guys do, they can do whatever they want to. That is what that passage means in Hebrews 13, 4. So anything within the confines of a legitimate biblical marriage that God recognizes, that's when the marriage bed is undefiled. But everything else is, uh, well...
Let's just pray and leave. <laughs> okay, shall we? Father, thank you so much for being the God that you are. You know, you've always known what is best for us and most glorifying for you. Father, I preach you'd help us to know your word, to honor your word, and to practice your word because it is best for us. May your will be done in our lives as we go forth into a very bright evening but a very dark world. The views we expressed tonight, shared tonight, talked about, thought about, prayed about tonight are rejected by the vast majority of the people outside these doors. Father, they need to see what Christianity is. They need to see it in us, not only in what we say, but in the way we live. Help us, Father, to do that everywhere we go, all the time. For we ask it all in Jesus' name, for his sake, with thanksgiving. Amen. Good night, and God bless you.